has come. Um, my name is Jim Cavanaugh, Douglas <laughs> County Commissioner and Chairman of the Douglas County Board um, Administrative Services Committee. Uh, and this hearing today of the Administrative Services Committee um, has officially opened a, a copy of the Open Meetings Law, I believe is available. If not, please see Douglas County Clerk Comptroller Dan Ash. Right over the corner. Uh, right on the wall. Uh, and um, we want to uh, thank uh, Dan uh, for coming, fellow uh, county elected official, uh, Clerk of the District Court, John Flynn, thank you. Uh, my colleague from the board, Claire Duda, thank you. Um, if I'm missing any other elected officials, please shout out. But um, we have the staff of the uh, Douglas County Board and uh, representatives of the county attorney's office here, as well as representatives of um, the sheriff's office and um, representatives from. 911, the director, acting director of Douglas County Corrections. Are there any other department heads here that I'm missing? Please make yourself known. Uh, and people will come in, and as we receive them, we'll, we'll introduce them as well. There is a um, sign in sheet going around someplace. Please <coughs> sign in. This is a public meeting, and public record is being made. We are on video. Uh, Minutes are being taken. Those will be available on the uh, county's website uh, via the Douglas County Clerk's uh, <coughs> portal. Uh, and as you can see, we've got kind of a full agenda today. We'd like to do these things as quickly as possible. Um, so we'll begin. Um, the Douglas County Juvenile Court, uh, I think it's actually the Douglas County Separate Juvenile Court is the uh, full title, uh, is represented here today. Uh, by uh, its presiding judge, uh, the Honorable uh, Matt Kaler. Thank you, Judge, for joining us. And um, the court administrator, Mr. Curtis, and the, the head of the uh, juvenile probation office, Mary <laughs> Bicek. Uh, so thanks, all of you, for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know from practicing law for a little bit how overwhelming a docket can be, and I don't think anybody's got a busier one than, than you do at the juvenile court. Um, it's no surprise that we are considering uh, a juvenile justice center, um, a juvenile justice courthouse, a juvenile courthouse, uh, among other things. Um, but the court itself um, is going to occupy, hopefully, uh, a new home. And that's one thing that I think there's a fair consensus uh, of opinion that we have outgrown the courthouse. Um, my colleague, Commissioner Duda, reminds us uh, that a hundred year old courthouse is, although an architectural jewel, uh, crammed to the rafters with um, courtrooms and administrative offices and court for the district court, county attorneys, and we've just outgrown it after a hundred years. And there are more coming. I think that the next juvenile court room under construction now is scheduled to come online the end of this year. Hopefully, yeah. And um, Commissioner Duda has been working with the legislature relative to additional juvenile court judges that um, are in the, the pipeline. And so we're planning for the future. And the courthouse that we're <coughs> occupying now, the Hall of Justice, um, was planned out and lasted a century. And what we would like to do is see this one as well planned uh, to uh, afford us a home for our juvenile judiciary for another century. And so we have, uh, for reference purposes, um, a document from the um, Douglas County uh, Public Property Office, which gives you an overview of the Douglas County uh, space currently and with growth factored in, that is just a starting point. I mean, basically what we wanted to do was hear from the court relative to their uh, needs. And so on this document, um, there are a variety of offices listed that were subject to previous hearings. Now we're down to the Douglas County Juvenile Court and related 
juvenile probation and juvenile assessment center uh, components of that uh, operation. <coughs> so, without further ado, I'd like to, to call on uh, Judge Kaler to, uh, to give us his assessment of what the court has and what the court needs. Judge? Thank you. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matt Kaler. I'm one of the newer juvenile court judges up here in Douglas County. And it's the bench's position that most of our input will come once the building is, our location is finalized. But what our needs are for the bench, uh, most, I, I assume everyone in this room really knows what those are. The first thing is space. Uh, for those of you that have been up in juvenile court or for those of you that have not, right now we are kind of crammed into a spot that wasn't intended to be a juvenile courthouse. So we have six judges and five courtrooms, one issue, and then we have a six courtroom being built currently. Right now, my understanding or our, our understanding is that the best practices for a courtroom has that a courtroom should be about 1,000 square feet. We average about 550 currently. And in juvenile court, unlike some of the other uh, district and county courtrooms, we will often have multiple parties represented by attorneys. We don't even have space for all the attorneys to sit with their clients at our council tables. Uh, we, we often have rows of attorneys and their clients because we don't have room to fit everyone uh, at, the, at the council tables in each courtroom. We have talked about whenever this new building comes about that we need as much natural light as possible. I've heard other people in these committees talk about the need for it to be inviting to the children that come in front of us. And right now we have, I'd say, the opposite. We have the courtrooms that do have windows have bars on the windows. And we have very little natural light in those courtrooms. So that would be another priority for us. <clears throat> another major priority would be one thing that is lacking on the sixth floor currently. We have absolutely no meeting rooms for parties and their clients. Uh, the only conference room we have is our makeshift sixth courtroom. We've been using that since I was appointed back uh, last last uh, fall. So that, that's another priority for the bench, that we have plenty of space for parties to meet with their clients, uh, for possible mediations to take place, uh, and even to separate parties. We have quite a few cases where parents on neglect cases or parents even on, for children that, have, that are charged with delinquency offenses have protection orders against each other. We have no space to separate those, those individuals in our, our lobby currently. So I, I'm no expert on square footage. I don't think anyone on the bench is. I, I know we need more. Whatever it is, we need more. I, I know the proposal has been 20% greater than what we have. It, it, I can't tell you for sure that that's what it would need. I know that it's just, as Jim stated, that's a number, but uh, it's, there's no doubt that we need more space uh, for what we're doing up there in juvenile court. I should also add, just by the nature of what we're doing, uh, as far as the galleries, we often have hearings that have quite a few people that come from family members supporting the individuals that are in court, to service providers, visitation workers, individuals from group homes, uh, gang specialists. We have all sorts of people that come in for each hearing. So it is imperative that we have more space in the next building. We also feel strongly that the probation should be part of the building, uh, this new juvenile courthouse. They are an arm of the court, and right now they are separate from us across the street. and, and I, I speak for the bench when I say that would be a priority for us to have probation in that same building. Also, and I think this has been in the proposals that I've seen, uh, we need room for expansion. Right now, we have six of us. I, we've talked about as many as uh, eight juvenile court judges at some point, maybe uh, sooner than we, we hope it's sooner than later. Uh, it took a long time to get six, so I don't know how long this will take, but we should obviously have room for expansion in the juvenile court moving forward for, I would say, at least uh, eight judges. So that, yes? No, just let that guy in. Okay. So that's, those are the basic needs for the juvenile court, uh, that, as I've stated. I do want to be heard uh, on the youth center issue. It's not, we're not getting involved as far as which location the youth center should be in, but the two things that are the concern of the bench are that the youth center should not be in the same building as the courtrooms, the same exact building. And second of all, I know that there's discussion on reducing the capacity of the Douglas County Youth Center. And there's no question we don't need the 144 beds that are currently there. Uh, but 
I, I do, I know, and again, speaking to the bench, we are concerned about that capacity number. Part of that is we don't control all the kids that are in the youth center. They're not there by juvenile court orders. Uh, currently, I, I think we average about 68% of the kids in the youth center at any given time are from juvenile court, uh, either pre or post adjudication, whatever the case may be. So the other approximately 30% could be from other jurisdictions, could be kids on adult charges, uh, could be kids for, on federal holds, could be, uh, could be any number of kids, and we have a breakdown of some, of some of those situations. But bottom line is that quite a few of the kids, so as of today, there are 75 kids, so uh, a little over 20 of those kids are probably outside juvenile court. We have no control over that. And so I, I, I want to caution that we be very careful as far as uh, what uh, ultimately what size center we build or, or if we are uh, whatever the decision is as far as where the youth center is going to end up, that we be careful in the capacity there. And that we also consider adding uh, staff secure placement as well, which is something we had in the past and we no longer have in Douglas County. The bottom line is at some point if, if juveniles are, they fit the qualifications for detention, uh, there will be an issue as far as where we detain those kids. Currently, for staff secure kids, for example, they may end up out of county because we don't have that resource here. So uh, those are the, the, the concerns of the bench as far as the use center. Judge? Um, yes. Does, you know why we got rid of the staff secure was because basically it was no different than the secure. And, and, and I so agree. So we'd have to figure something else out. And I agree. And I, I, I was a private practitioner for over a decade prior to taking the bench, and I visited kids, and I... I've been part of uh, JDI for uh, <coughs> six years and, and co-chaired the case processing committee. And I agree, I visited kids in, in staff security, it was no different, it was not, and we had those discussions and those meetings. But right now, what we have are, especially if we're decreasing the capacity of the youth center, we have shelter beds, and we have the youth center, and we have home. Those are the three options. And we have had, it, it feels like we frequently have issues where the shelters are filled up, so then we're left with youth center or home, and there are cases where, for whatever reason, home is not appropriate at that time. So, Judge, so um, just for my edification, maybe others, a shelter bed is what? So a shelter bed is considered, it's not a locked facility, it's, it's considered a temporary placement uh, for, to wait out whatever the next step may be, whether it's, sometimes kids go to, uh, to shelters for crisis stabilization where probation works with the family to get the home to a point where the child can move back home as soon as possible. Sometimes home is not an option for whatever reason. Parents don't show to court. They're, they are missing or whatever the case may be. So shelter is appropriate for those kids that are lower risk and should not be detained at the youth center even on a temporary basis. But it is a temporary stopgap essentially between whatever the previous placement was and whatever the next step would be. So um, if we could just go back to the top. I mean, we're just talking what you've got now, space-wise. I have to make it real for you. Okay. Uh, what we've what we've got now, and what you uh, might move into, and you you see what public property has provided for us with the existing square footage for Douglas County Probation. It's fifteen thousand three hundred square feet in leased facility, which is the key line building. And then um, the Douglas County Juvenile Court, um, which is um, 13,600 square feet on the sixth floor of the courthouse. Um, and it gives you a breakdown of uh, square feet in the courtrooms and square feet for the uh, judge. So that's existing. Um, and that, you know, is roughly 28,000, 29,000 square feet existing. And then um, the 20% growth factor, if you go to the, the last column, would take that to um, about 36,000 square feet. So, you know, you go up maybe 10,000 square feet. Again, these are jumping off numbers. We have to start someplace. But um, it would be an entire building dedicated primarily to the juvenile court judiciary, probation office, and the administration office of that judiciary, uh, with anticipation of um, an additional 
Is it seventh and eighth judge that you're anticipating on coming in the, in the relatively near, near future? So, you know, those are the parameters, and based on what we know today and, and what we can forecast for the future, you know, we wanted to hear about you. First of all, I, I presume that public property is pretty good at their job if they gave us some accurate numbers for your existing. And, and you know, if, if there's some other idea other than our 20%, you needed to start, start someplace, we'd like to hear from you if there's, you know, a greater number or a different number or something like that. It doesn't have to be right now, but at some point as this process goes forward, you're the ones going to have to live there. Our feeling is that it should accommodate you and it should accommodate the future of the court for, you know, maybe another hundred years. Does that resonate with you? I mean, are the numbers here at least in the ballpark? Again, none of us are <coughs> experts on this. I know there are space studies and, and I, all I know is it needs to be bigger. That's all I know. Okay. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's as good as we can get. I know that... Um, <coughs> Commissioner Duda has the longest experience of <coughs> commissioners, having served on the Building Commission for God knows how many years, a long time, uh, and has looked at this and has really been a driver on this, uh, you know, which is probably, of, of everything that we're t discussing, the most pressing need. And I'd like you, Claire, to maybe weigh in here about what, if anything, you see as the future for the judiciary portion of this problem. I know that. You've expressed this in the past relative to we've outgrown where we're at. And what do we do next? Oh, I think this is the one area where uh, this is probably the one and only area where we could get a seven to nothing vote on the county board to say we've got to have more juvenile court meetings. Everybody recognizes that. The question is how much, uh, you know, how to pay for it. <laughs> but uh, building at least for eight courtrooms only makes sense. I mean, the legislature's already been talking about the seven to eight judges. That will just meet our need for short term, I think, if we just go with eight, eight judges. And, you know, I think that uh, it's good to know the, uh, the best practice square footage for a courtroom <coughs> that you bring to us today is 1,000 square feet. So if we're talking <coughs> eight, you know, I'm no mathematical <coughs> genius, but I think that's around 8,000 square feet right there. My question would be, having been in a lot of courtrooms, is that your courtroom, your chamber, your bailiff, your clerk, I guess just the courtroom itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, uh, a lot of times that other component, which is the office of the courtroom, uh, could be maybe up to 50% again as large as the courtroom. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in your courtroom, which is <laughs> no offense, but it's kind of tiny. It's true. And, uh, I, you know, I've been in district courtrooms from the old courthouse, which were built 100 years ago, but were very ample. Uh, and I don't know, and Jerry, maybe you can help us with this, what, you know, one of the district courtrooms would be relative to the courtroom space and the, and the administrative space. Well, let me back up, try to answer the question about the sixth floor. <clears throat> and hopefully a few of you have been up there to see it, as the judge indicated. Uh, that was a jail, and if we've been around long enough, we know that people tried to escape from that jail and were successful. <laughs> so this square footage is existing, but it's a moving, there's been so many band-aids put on the sixth floor. Now, <clears throat> the total of 13 six existing, that is including removal of the county attorney juvenile division to accommodate the new courtroom. Right. Along with that, it got chopped up again. And I judge I, I can't remember if the new design for that courtroom included a family room or a I think conference they, there room. will be conference rooms added to the outside of that. Yeah. So, so that's probably in that eighteen hundred total, I think. Probably. But yeah. it, it's really hard to uh, detail this if you haven't seen it because it has been band-aid approach for years right. and that's why we're where we're at okay and, and I think that's good to know um, the, the question and if you don't know 
I, I don't know the square foot. Okay. There is a what standards. we need, what we would need, what would be helpful in this process is let's get a square footage on you know one of the district court rooms downstairs. I mean that would be kind of an ideal. And if we're going for a hundred year solution, I don't want to do this again. I know that Claire Duda never wants to do this again. We're going to do it right the first time. So starting with. You know, the judge is aware of best practices for a courtroom, but we know that it's bigger than that. Comparing it to what we already have, you know, historically these district courtrooms are kind of the biggest and most ample uh, that we have in our judiciary here. What are those? And maybe we can go from there to there, because my impression would be that a thousand square foot sounds like a lot, but I don't know if that. You know, if you go down downstairs to uh, any district court room, whether that's a lot more than a thousand square feet or a lot less, it, but it please is. find out. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll find out. Okay. okay. And then uh, again, the the administrative offices behind that, the judges' chambers, the bailiff's uh, office, and the and the court reporter as well. Very good. Very good. So um, the courtrooms that you have. The 550 square foot court, courtrooms that you have, is that all in, or is that that the courtroom itself not inclusive of your administration? <coughs> not inclusive of administration or our staff. It's just, just the courtroom okay. um, Going forward, you mentioned that there's not room for all attorneys in the courtroom. That's literally in the courtroom itself. Yes. Where they're conducting business, there's no place well, for them to. Not, if, if we're proper, you would be able to have every party there in court with their attorneys seated at council table. I think Judge Sirkovich may have the only courtroom that's able to accommodate uh, you know, enough, enough attorneys and parties, but currently it's a first come, first serve. So whichever parent really is in there first gets to sit at the table with their attorney, and then the others are kind of either on the, off the side or, or behind that. So. You know, and I've sat in a fair number of courtrooms over my time for proceedings and trials and whatever. And normally there would be um, an adult court, you know, a, a counsel for the defense, counsel for the state. That's not the, the format of juvenile court, I understand that. But those would be case specific. So if it was Jones v. Nebraska, you know, the defense would be sitting here and the, and the prosecutor would be sitting there. In a juvenile court setting, are the cases called up individually, and just those people sit at that table for that case? Or yes, okay. Um, but there would be multiple lawyers in an, an individual case. You would have a prosecutor, a guardian item for the children, usually an attorney for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, on a neglect case, a, a mother and a father with their attorneys. Some parents have guardian items appointed for them. Sometimes we have other intervening parties with attorneys. Uh, we <coughs> can have um, any number of people there. And we could have multiple fathers on, a, on the same docket, multiple mothers and fathers on the same docket, potentially. So you could have three or four parents in one case. So a council table could kind of look like this, maybe. Right? <laughs> I think yeah. this would be nice, yeah. <laughs> um, the natural lighting, I think that the you know, you, you express, and it's also in the uh, Chin report that uh, recognizes that that's something throughout the juvenile system that we should have as much of as possible. In your courtrooms, and the ones that I've seen, I'm old enough to remember what Jerry Leahy was talking about when I was in jail. It's called ZMOD. And uh, in your courtrooms, like those small windows in your chambers, there are barred windows in all the courtrooms? Uh, five out of the six courtrooms, uh, excuse me, four out of the six courtrooms have windows. They all have bars in their windows, I think, about four. And one of the courtrooms has uh, two of them, the temporary one and, and one of the other ones have no windows in them currently. So, I mean, I got to tell you, there's very little natural light that gets through these 100 year old bar windows, and obviously none that gets through if there's no windows at all. So. That's telling. Um, as to meeting rooms, um, my experience in touring the court is 
there's an enormous, well, not enormous, there's a large lobby room, commons room, as you enter the court with the reception area and then just benches, benches like in the bus station. Yes. Okay. That's the meeting room for the current court? I mean, that's, it's not utilized as that. Right now, there, as I stated before, there is no space, there are no spaces for meetings. Uh, so we are looking for not only areas for attorneys to meet with their clients, whether they be adult or minor children privately, or guardian items to meet with, with children, uh, or rooms to separate parties that can't be in the same room due to court orders or protection orders. But also, uh, before we had six of us, the, the, the temporary courtroom was a conference room, and that was utilized at times uh, for family team meetings where caseworkers get together with the service providers and the parents, or meetings between attorneys and their clients, um, any number of things. So we, we have a, a very strong need for room for that. We will get some relief in December or January with the new courtroom to have a couple of those, although we don't have understandings that's not just for juvenile court. I think the other courtrooms can preserve those as well. But My experience in courtrooms, in addition to the courtroom proper, judges' chambers, bailiff's quarters, court reporter's office, there was a jury room that often would be used for the purposes that you're talking about. You know, if the, if the court said, go talk to your client, and there needed to be some confidentiality, you would go into this jury room. And they were courtroom specific. Each courtroom had a jury room. Is that something that you would anticipate on this? Each courtroom would have kind of a meeting room? Or? No, I think off the main, whatever the lobby would look like, just somewhere where people would have access to that. And I, they, we've talked about some of those meeting rooms being able to be accessed for mediations uh, between parties and, and in family team meetings. So I'm not saying each courtroom would need to have it. We just need spaces for people to be able to meet with, with the parties before but, and after court. Right. Maybe not one for each courtroom, but more than just one. Yes. Okay. So somewhere between one and eight. Uh, right. Okay. Um, the probation, which is currently, I believe, occupying two floors of the Q Line building. Is that right? Three floors. Three floors. Uh, and where I started off as a as a lawyer for Douglas County. Been updated since then. I uh, probably not. A little bit ago, but um, that is fifteen thousand three hundred square feet <laughs> currently, and I don't know, not having been there recently, if that's adequate space, too small of a space, if you're on top of each other. When I was in there, we had three lawyers in one office, and we shared, pushed together desks. That's how much space we had. What's it like? So it's still crowded. I have um, about 27 or 28 staff sharing 14 offices. Um, so I do have people on top of each other. Um, the the key line building is really not set up to serve juveniles either. Um, while we don't have bars on the windows, we have chicken wire. There isn't a lot of natural light. It's an old building. It's not um, ADA compliant. The restrooms, you have to go up a step to get into on every floor. Uh, it's not a secure building in that we share the key line building with private attorneys. Um, so the security is, is a challenge. We have buzz-in spaces for our space, but anybody from the public can come into that building, wander around the building, wander in the stairwells, um, go down the basement. We have had uh, numerous incidents of people coming in the building where we've had to contact law enforcement to that didn't have anything to do with juvenile probation, but we're just there. Um, Douglas County Public Properties, Jerry Leahy and his staff have done a wonderful job of trying to support us, as have the sheriff with some, you know, some panic buttons and, and uh, things we can do when we need that help, but it's just not, again, the right space for families. We don't have the appropriate meeting rooms. We have the same issue with we might have a mother and a father and siblings and a treatment provider and a counselor and the child's teacher. Um, we just don't have the space to, to appropriately serve people and have all those conversations. 
that we need to in a confidential way. I think that's the other piece. I, I worked on the adult side for 25 years, and then I've been on the juvenile side for six years. And the thing that strikes me the most wrong about the juvenile court space and the juvenile probation space is the cases that come up to juvenile court are complicated. They're confidential. You don't want to be sharing your family's business with everybody, but you're all up there in that, in that space in that shared meeting room space and sometimes that's the only place that you have to have that conversation with your attorney or with your child's therapist and it's just not appropriate so on both sides the court side and the probation side we really do need space that's better for kids and families and for the staff you had mentioned that yesterday about um, supporting the staff and the people that do the work it'd be nice to have a space to come to work every day where people felt safe and it was clean and right. Judge, I think you indicated in your opening remarks that it um, would be essential to have the courts and probation under the same roof. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. And, and the rationale to do that is what? Well, again, our arm of the court, we deal with probation on a daily basis and we send kids. And right now, what we've done, as long as I can remember, when we send kids off or, or before my time as a judge, they'd be sent to probation after a plea or a trial to be set for their sentencing or disposition, they're handed a map and said, go outside, go to the probation office, and they'll see you in a month. So they don't go, they don't go, I mean, it's it's uh, not the most efficient or effective system there. So it'd be nice to have them in the building. Again, we have regular contact with probation. Uh, they are in our each courtroom every day, and so I, I, I think they're in the central Part of the court need to be with us. We should do that. Anything on the probation aspects? Um, I think we've addressed the room for the eighth courtroom being built into this because we don't anticipate doing this again. So, you know, whatever square footage we come up with, and I think that's something to take away from this that we can get a public property's help on, uh, would be times eight. Uh, and then the that square footage that we have for probation, you know, working with you to see if that's adequate to actually get to where we need to be at 18,360. Um, that all into the uh, juvenile courthouse. Um, what about the juvenile assessment center? Uh, what about the other services, the uh, day evening services uh, that are affiliated with the juvenile justice. So, so a number of those services uh, are currently in the community, and and I, I think it's the position of the bench that they should remain there. So day and evening reporting, for example, we have various providers that are out in the community versus being located uh, at the courthouse, um, and that would go for. I'm trying to think of the other services we utilize. Really, anything. I, it, it's our stance that should remain in the community versus being there. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, any of our other elected officials would have a question at this point because I want to move into some of the questions I have before we finish up with this section. No questions, just concerns about the level of staff I'm going to need and the space available to be able to do the judge's work in whatever facility that we build. That's my only concern. And the clerk of the district court, um, tell me how that interacts with the juvenile court. We, as the clerk of the district court, would be the ex officio clerk of the juvenile court. We do the same thing in district court that we do for the 16 district court judges uh, that we do. We do the, the all of the clerk work and processing of all the paperwork of all the 16 district court judges and I have a supervisor and five staff jammed into a postage stamp size office up on the sixth floor right now which is in the process of building more space or giving us that little hallway just as a short term uh, and if they're going to put eight judges in there I'll probably need at least a couple of extra I'm assuming you would do a 10 by 15 cubicle or 10 by 10 cubicle for each one of those I don't know what the square footage would be for that, but I would assume that we would be close to the court administrator's <coughs> office because we work so closely with them. I don't know what the layout would be, but that would be a design that I would like to have input in. Okay. Uh, 
That's great. I, I wasn't aware that you provided that services. Do you we know? Get a ton, we have a lot more clerk work to do, as almost as much <coughs> in the separate juvenile courts that we do in district court in the form of judges' work orders and, and that kind of thing. We get, people probably won't believe this, 200 orders a day out of the five juvenile court judges. I don't get 200 orders a day out of 16 district court judges. So it's a lot of work well, that they process. Um, those orders, and I know that's come a long way in terms of <coughs> record keeping, those are physical orders yes. and electronic records. Both. We elect, we scan those records in, and they're put into our case management system, which we refer to as justice. But yes, they're paper order. We would like to go paperless sooner than later, but that's another another conversation down the road. Yes, exactly. And so you have basically six FTEs up on six doing that now. Yes. A you know small the supervisor's office and one open area uh, with very small cubicles that are in there. And do you know, or Jerry, do you know what the square footage of that space is? It, it's probably in this entire. I don't. I don't even know it's within the. It might be in that in that thirteen six, but I can't say. Yeah. No one's it, been able to tell me if that. He, when he said postage stamp, he's probably correct. In cubicles, okay. but. Well, going forward, because we're a little pressed for time here. Yeah. Let's see if we can get a breakdown, and if that's in that number, yeah. fine. But if it's additional to that number, we need to know it. Um, and I don't know, Commissioner Duda, if you'd have anything on that component you'd like to ask. Or no. uh, I just got a few kind of follow-ups on, on things that you touched on. Um, we have had discussions about the facilities, you know, to administer juvenile justice, um, but we haven't really talked much about the programs in those facilities to actually help our kids, which is the prime directive. Best interest of the kids, I don't know a lot about juvenile law, but best interest of the kids, I think it's a prime directive. Am I right? That's correct. Okay. So when we're doing this redo, and we're going to spend considerable resources doing it under any scenario, what programmatically, what do we put in those buildings programmatically that maybe we're not doing now or we're not doing as robustly now or we, we could copy a better program from someplace else that's had success? What would you say programmatically? Well, I, I mean, it's, I think overall the, the same reason I'd like probation in the same building, uh, we would like to be able to have at least some resources in there for families as they leave because same issue with probation. When we send families away, it was uh, on them to make the journey over to probation. Some do and some don't. But we, uh, you know, are, we rely quite a bit on services from the community for evals and uh, of all types, chemical dependency evals, psychological evals, and being able to have some sort of access point to services uh, so we can get these families faster would be advantageous. And, I know uh, we've talked before about, in particular, and I've talked to Ms. Weiss about it before, psychiatric services in juvenile court are, are a constant issue because unlike other services, chemical dependency evals for kids or adults with drug and alcohol issues or psychological evals, some of those we can get done relatively quickly, maybe three weeks, something like that, and get a quick turnaround. Psychiatric evals, we sometimes wait for months. So unless a juvenile or parents have a current treating psychiatrist, we, that's the only way for us to get a, a fast turnaround as far as uh, whether or not there's further psychiatric uh, intervention necessary, medication. And it's not rocket science. A lot of these cases, the psychiatric issues drive sometimes the chemical dependency usage, the, the, the dynamics at home, dynamics at school. So that's been incredibly frustrating since long before I was on the bench, it's always been an issue. We, so I, I, I hope moving forward we're able to identify a way to provide a wide array of psychiatric services in addition to everything that we're, we are already doing, but find a way to get, get those services in place or at least a referral in place faster and get providers that are willing to provide those services. Okay. And in the evaluation process, particularly the psychiatric evaluation process, this delay of months, can that contribute to the length of stay of a kid in our youth center? 
Well, it should not ever directly affect that because there are, none of us would ever leave a kid in the youth center waiting for a psychiatric because of that delay. It's just not an option. But again, if the psychiatric, lack of psychiatric intervention is causing the child to have issues in other places at home or at school, uh, it's conceivable that that, that uh, could lead to detention because they can't maintain their placement. So it all, it all flows downhill from there. So it is imperative, again, that we get something in place for those kids okay. and adults, the adults that are on the neglect cases as well. But it could, so it could indirectly lead, yes, to a longer stay. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've talked about in terms of the Douglas County um, Health Center Board of Trustees, which is, you know, we suffer community-wise from a dearth of adequate psychiatric care. And it's something that I've heard a lot from you and the bench and from practitioners of juvenile law the, the children suffer from a lack of adolescent psychiatric care uh, while, while they're in our custody and while they're under our supervision and while they're in the system. That, that, yeah, that's correct. The, the state, which is the provider of last resort for this care, is, it sounds like understaffed in this regard, leading to these long delays. Well, I, I think, I think the, the challenge is finding practitioners that are willing to uh, to conduct those psyche evals and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's just we need providers, we need people, we need bodies that are willing to do it and do it competently, and that's that's where the challenge is. So it's not really it's not a payment issue. It's not it's just finding the people willing to do it. We have plenty of people willing to provide <coughs> chemical dependency evals, psychological evals, therapy for children. We're getting more and more specialized therapists for some of the other issues we've seen uh, come up over the last few years, but. Psychiatric help has been the one thing that sticks out, at least in my mind, is something where we never have enough. Okay. And that's a, a subset specialty. I mean, adolescent <coughs> psychiatry is, is a subset specialty of, of psychiatric medicine. So we're actually looking for that specialty right. practitioner. Right. Okay. Um, the beds issue that you addressed before, we have capacity, I think, on uh, you said in the 140, 144, 44 bed range at the Douglas County Youth Center now. We currently have a population of, it varies from about 75 to 80, uh, and there are literally uh, mods that have been decommissioned that are no longer in use, which is a good thing because we're down from a high of 144 to this 70 plus uh, population. Um, the proposal going forward, I, I think I heard you say, needs to take into to account the existing population. Um, and hopeful that we will realize over time what we've realized over the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, we've gone down from over 100 to this 70 to 80. And maybe going forward, with the right programs and the right care and the right system in place and the right facilities, we go down even further. But that's not going to happen overnight. So is it right that we right-size this at about where, you know, our experience is now or, you know, like we're doing in the, in the look forward on the courts? We're saying, you're here, but we want to build to here because you're going to get bigger. This, at least one of the proposals says, we're here, but we're going to build here because we want you to get smaller. And I'm just wondering, where should we build that? I mean, what, what should that bar be? Well, I don't, I don't have a number for you today. Just my concern is, again, there are so many kids that are there that the juvenile court has no jurisdiction over. So uh, kids on adult charges and federal holes and, and whatnot. And so there's definitely a trend over the last few years for fewer kids being detained in Douglas County. And again, as I said before, I was the co-chair of case processing for JDI for years. And, our whole purpose of JDI is detaining fewer kids and decreasing the length of detention. So I'm as big an advocate of that as anyone, but I also want to be realistic that the, there are kids that, for whatever reason, have to be detained, uh, as seen by the court, even on a temporary basis. And I, I am concerned about decreasing the capacity to not much higher than what the kids that are on, in on uh, non-juvenile court cases 
thereby tying the court's hands as far as options uh, for these kids. So that's, the, I don't have a number to give you today. Yeah, this no, is how many beds we should have, but that's, that's my concern. The and kids best. directly under your control, this population of, let's say, you know, 75, uh, and you got 68% of those. So that would be just those kids, which you do have some control over, would exceed the 44 bed uh, capacity I think as of right now, as of today. We're right above 54. We have 54 of them there today. Yes. Okay. And that's without including kids being held for adult crimes, kids right. being held by federal jurisdiction. So the other 26 kids there today are outside of juvenile court, from, but the house and Phillips County Youth Center. Today would be 49, just the, the average of the years. Okay. 49 are under juvenile court? Correct. Then the balance are or other, I mean, I think we do some federal immigration. Yes. I, I, I don't know if we're <coughs> right currently, but we do. Yeah, we have kids in there right now in those holds as well. Okay. Um, and that's totally beyond the court's control. We understand that, and we'll talk to you know other people in the system who can contribute to that. But you know, we want to right size our facility so that we have the maximum capacity to take kids that. Otherwise, say it was too small, and it's all full up, where do the kids go? Well, as I stated earlier, I know that we discussed as a bench, ultimately, we use risk assessment instruments, and we have hearings where the parties are able to argue whether or not a, a juvenile should be detained. And uh, the staff secure, I used as an example earlier, if, if a judge now in Douglas County orders a kid in staff secure, they end up uh, in SARPY, for example, if SARPY accepts them. So that's because we don't have that service here in Douglas County. Well, the same if there are no beds available in Douglas County, if, if the court's ordering detention, it'll be, I would guess, a similar situation. They wouldn't be, they could not be housed in the Douglas County Correctional Center, but there are, uh, there would have to be another option. Um, the Kids that are charged in adult court that, that, that you know couldn't be um, housed in Douglas County Corrections, even in a segregated facility, could not be housed in Douglas County Corrections, even if they had a this is dedicated to juvenile adult court right. people that could not be right. in that Douglas County right. Corrections campus. Um, that overflow, then you're saying, would be placed someplace outside of Douglas County. I. Again, I don't know, but that's I don't I imagine that would be what we do. That's what we do now for staff security. So. Okay, and that's a rare occasion when that happens, but that does still happen. Okay. Um, the final one that I had on my list, and I don't know, Commissioner, do any of these? Please feel free to ask away. But um, the final one on my list was uh, the question of restraints, which you've heard over and over. Uh, in the discussion of this, I think everybody's uncomfortable with the uh, idea of kids in restraints. Who wouldn't be? Um, and the sheriff's office has uh, sent a representative. And in our discussion, my understanding is that at least in the most recent past, children brought to court are not in restraints in juvenile court, correct? Correct. They, they are removed before the end of the court. Okay. But children brought to Court, and this is Officer Captain Sellers. Sellers. Captain Sellers, sorry. They have uh, restraints on when they're brought from the corrections to Right. And, you know, what we're looking at is obviously we want to minimize the restraints necessary for uh, kids. Um, but the idea that you're uh, transporting them, and I've seen this in the courthouse on innumerable occasions, all different people in custody uh, moved from here to there, is based on what, Captain? I mean, the, the reason for the restraints is based on what? Well, two reasons for the safety for them and for us. If the kids, their, their minds aren't really quite there yet. I uh, would imagine how many would probably try to run off once given the chance, and then for our safety. These, these kids aren't kids that we all have necessarily in a home right now. Some of these kids are in there for murder. Some very, 
you look at, and for all sense and purpose, that these kids are larger than the most, some of our deputies, and, and they want to fight. So there's no way, heck, I'm ever taking these restraints off unless I'm ordered by the court to do so. It's just, it's our safety. I wouldn't get, it, there's no way we could do it. But but they are removed now before. Yeah, I'm once, just talking about to put them in the family. Right. And, you know, you've got two categories again, the category that's going to uh, the juvenile court, um, which are never in restraints in court, and then the category that's going to adult district courts. And is there a different protocol for treating those two different populations? All the same. Um, we have, I think, received some statistics from the sheriff's office relative to this transportation question. And basically, as I understand it, there's a twice a day, five days a week uh, transport from Douglas County Youth Center to the courts. They're a bad. Um, and it, in that period of time, which 42nd Street to downtown, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes on the outside, I guess, um, these children are in a van, in a secure van, correct? Is that the, yeah. That's how you do it, right? Um, and the restraints that are employed, I mean, are they handcuffs or are they those plastic things? What are, what are handcuffs they? and uh, they call them shackles. Okay. And when they when they get in the van at the youth center, those are put on, and when they get out at the they're, they're placed on when we get to the youth center, and then they're placed in the van. We get out of the van once we're in our secure sally port, and then they're taken taken upstairs. And, and are they are they in those restraints all the way up to the holding cells? Okay. Um, per day, and I know this is probably hard for you to say, but those two runs um, out of our population of say 75 kids, how many kids on average? In your best estimate, I understand. I'm not holding it at any specific. Would be how many kids per day uh, coming in total on both? Um, these children that are uh, held for disposition in the juvenile court, and I think that the number that has been used is around 50 days average stay. I don't know if that is all in or your cohort. Or I'm not sure the numbers are there. I've heard different numbers. But yeah. Okay. Uh, a kid held for adjudication in juvenile court would go to court, have this trip approximately how many times in the course of this case? Well, if they're detained before trial, they that would take place at any detention hearing. The, they probably would not be brought over for the pretrial, depending on which courtroom it is. So then it would be brought over for the adjudication itself, which typically for a criminal case or delinquency would take uh, just one day. It would take longer than that, typically. And then uh, they would be they could have the detention reviewed again at that time, and then they'd be brought back for the uh, disposition or sentencing hearing after that. Uh, I do want to mention what I'm thinking about, too, as far as security for the deputies. One of the other things that I didn't mention before that we want in the new building would be one of our issues with the juveniles that are detained that we're supposed to keep them separate, out of sight of the public, especially the kids in the jumpsuits. On the sixth floor, uh, right now, there, the way it's it's fashioned is that the public sitting in the lobby, there are two chances really for them to see a juvenile being brought uh, down from the, the, the sheriff's the holding cell to the courtrooms. And so that does pose sometimes security risks for the deputies uh, that are transporting the uh, juveniles, but uh, also it's not supposed to happen. We're not supposed to let these juveniles be seen uh, until they're in the courtroom. So we would we are hoping for separate circulation uh, systems in the new building for the deputies to be able to take juveniles to the courtroom for, for the uh, for the bench to be able to get access to each other's courtrooms. Right now, it's everybody's in the same hallways, and for the uh, general public as well. So, I mean, what you're talking about, I think that it's referred to sometimes uh, colloquially as the walk of shame. Is we need to eliminate that entirely, so that these kids are not humiliated by right. being seen in. Shackles or jumps. Right. right. Yes. Okay. That should be 
possible to build. But you would have this secure holding facility that uh, the captain referred to for when they're brought from wherever they are, but before they're they waiting to come into court, yes. Are the populations of kids being held in adult court and kids being held for adjudication in juvenile court, are those holding facilities the same room or are they separate? Um, I really want to thank. Same theory has to be, they have to be separated by sight and sound. These two populations? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I really want to thank you and the court for your participation today. This has been invaluable, and I'd like to thank the sheriff's office uh, for coming down and, and contributing to this discussion. We have a bunch of people here, uh, and there's folks that uh, are from our administration. I don't know if they would have any um, uh, questions. I'd start with the elected officials again. Uh, John and Dan, if you have anything. No questions. Um, and our administrators, Patrick, Diane, anybody? Okay. Uh, well, one second. Yes, Dan. Just uh, so <coughs> say the youth center removed to a facility that's uh, within walking distance. Would you imagine that when they're, they are transferred over from facility in walking distance, would they have a major gain answer about? So you're talking about this, if we built it from south of here? Yeah, or just whatever, yes. Yeah, so would they, they didn't need to be uh, handcuffed and shackled on the way over if they were walking over, or is it just because they're going to be with No, just because they're leaving their secure environment coming here. Okay. So that wouldn't be, if, say, we built something on 18th and Howard, that would eliminate the need to. Well, then, well, would it be an outside walk, or would it be like a sidewalk? <laughs> you know, we've heard a lot of different options. But, uh, I think it would be from building, yeah. from adjoining yeah. building. Yeah. 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 No outside. No outside. Yeah, we wouldn't. Outside, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I know they're kids and we're doing everything we can for them, but some of these kids, uh, you wouldn't want to sit in a room with them. Yeah. <laughs> and if, for anybody in here that wants to try and then tell me something different, uh, then we'll talk. Well, no, I was just curious because of a point, this has nothing to do with my job, it just as I'm listening to the meeting yesterday, yep. a point brought up would be why it'd be better to have them over there is that if they, it sounded me yesterday, the talking point was that that would eliminate the need for shackles well, and handcuffs. Yeah, I mean, if, if if they were over there and their courtroom is over there, they don't have to leave the building. It's always a secure building. We also have to talk about that building needs to be secure because of their courtrooms. And so far, nobody's really reached out to me too much to find what that number and how many bodies I'm going to need to do so. I mean, we're talking about civilian, by civilian employees that would have to be the entrance security officers and the deputies to uh, also uh, secure those courtrooms. And I think that we've heard, Judge, that this facility, if it's, you know, wherever it is, is not in the courthouse. It's a separate building from the right. courthouse under any scenario that you would find in your favor. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, John? No. Um, I promise that you'd be done in an hour, and it's an hour, so you're done, and I know that you've got cases to go. We're going to have public comment here, and uh, people are uh, uh, good to stay on that, but I really want to thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate and, you know, the guiding principle is what's best for the kids and best for the taxpayers, and you guys have done a great job of helping us figure out what's best for the kids. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, very, everybody's checking it out. <laughs> All right. We have um, one more quick order of business to attend to, and then we have um, the uh, regular scheduled public property update on our uh, construction project for the public safety bond issue. Um, the Juvenile Justice Center strategic planning, if you've been following this at all, um, has moved into uh, a public, some would say very public stage of hearings. Um, and we had a hearing, robust hearing yesterday uh, before the entire Douglas County Board. We're continuing those uh, hearings, uh, as you see with the court today, which kind of is the fourth of a series uh, that involved the county attorney, the public defender, uh, the Douglas County Youth Center, and now uh, two days of court hearings. 
we plan on continuing this series of hearings with um, an upcoming hearing or two uh, from uh, individuals who are currently or formerly involved in the um, youth system. Uh, we heard yesterday some compelling testimony from individuals who said everybody's being heard from except the people that are actually experiencing the Douglas County Youth Center and their families. So we will be holding a specific <coughs> hearing uh, to invite them to come and uh, address this question of how we best uh, plan this forward. Um, and that will be announced uh, probably in the next uh, day or two for the very near future. But for now, we have basically some proposals that I think um, have been well publicized relative to the juvenile center uh, the juvenile courthouse, uh, the youth center, detention center, uh, and uh, lawyers' quarters, county, city staff quarters. Um, we intend to have the public have every opportunity to uh, comment on these, and so at this point we'll take say, the next little bit of time, I hate to, to set anything off, but uh, to solicit public testimony on what we have heard to date, and I think a lot of people have done a great job of following this over time, uh, that, you know, if you can stay on point and maybe stay on time and take a minute to address us, uh, I know there's a lot of people that want to talk, uh, we'll get through as many as we can, say, in the next 15 minutes, and then we'll have the public poverty uh, uh, Report and so hopefully finish by 3:30, 3:35. So two minutes for me. <laughs> You've done this before. You're a pro. Uh, so is there anyone from the public that would like to be heard on the? Uh, yeah, come up and take a seat. We're we're videoing these for public records purposes, and so um, it's difficult for them to see who's talking unless they're. There. And give your name for the record, please. All right, I'm Sharon Martin. I'm a resident. I live in the old market, but I'm an educator. I've been an educator since um, 1970, and so uh, the kids in this part of the, the meeting that uh, was just discussed is very important to me, as I have heard it's important to uh, so many in this community. Um, first of all, I have to say I'm a little shocked that it seems like the needs assessment that was done this morning seemed new to a lot of people. And I can't imagine doing a project this huge without that needs assessment having been done. Um, I um, have worked in many places where people, yesterday they talked about Paragon a bit. And you know, when we want something sometimes, you have a paradigm that's fixed. It's like, we need more space. Well, what specifically are you talking about, and why? And to have that discussion is something that I think was done this morning on this piece, as it should be done on each piece of what we're talking about for this entire project. And so I just want to say publicly how much this detail-oriented needs assessment is being done by you, Mr. Kavanaugh. And uh, I just want to publicly say it's very important. Um, when we look, there's economic concerns that were brought up um, concerning the fact that you're looking at a, a potentially revenue producing area taken up for um, in a way that doesn't just serve the needs of, um, we, first of all, let me say we all agree that there's public space that needs to be committed to the needs of the court. And it's very counterintuitive to say that we should reduce the number of rooms and beds available to these students and these kids who are incarcerated. This is an experiment that's being done like in Washington State. It's not even something that is results oriented. I don't see any data that supports 
that with fewer beds, the crime level will go down. It's very counterintuitive. I mean, how, how can you even buy into that concept? It's an experiment to say that that might happen. So I thought today to listen to somebody who deals with this every day, whether it is the, the police or whether it's the court and the judge, we need to listen to these people before we make some lofty concept that we hope will work when we're making this big of an investment. So, thank I'll you very much. That. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, we went over just a tad on that one. So, if someone else would like to speak, uh, we're just kind of uh, pressed for time here. If not, I mean, we're not we're not looking to fill. Anybody else, please I, go I, first, because I had a say this morning. Okay. But You've got a name? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a little hard to hear him, but I think I like what I heard today. Speaking away from me, so I couldn't hear, but okay. I did have a little say-so this morning. Okay. Uh, Can you give me your name, please? Larry Storer, <coughs> Omaha, Douglas County. I'm not a total stranger to social programs and things. I've been on Boy Scouts, and I've been on House Parent, et cetera. I've got kids. Uh, I've got a grandson in the system that's in and out of the system, in and out of home. And I just want to say that, yes, we need to help the kids. But, you know, how many organizations do we have to hire at rather expensive dollar amounts to come in and try to help us fix it? There's something wrong with our kids, or something wrong with our parents, or something wrong with our schools, or something wrong with our churches and social agencies when the programs aren't working. We've seen stories in the World Herald recently about the contraction of the number of service providers due to collaboratives. Lots of different reasons, but some of it's money. And we're down to maybe one now, and they've changed the name. It's no longer Nebraska Families Collaborative. Those people provide good services, yes, when it's needed. But how come it doesn't work? Now, do we really have to build another building to close them in when everybody wants them to have free space? This, we got to get the shackles off, then this maybe doesn't work. Tough love doesn't work either, so there's there's got to be something. But I, but I can tell you in my experience that the professionals, the experts, the, the partners, the stakeholders, the uh, foundations, uh, the people we've hired. Well, for instance, the state hired a Pennsylvania court judge, Supreme Court judge, to come in, tell us how to find children. Excuse me, we know how to knock on doors and find children. My grandson was three years old. They they didn't find him, but that was part of the social program. Was determine what kids out there need help and go get them the help. Well, in order to do that, you have to <clears throat> stomp on somebody's rights. And when you stomp on somebody's rights, you upset people. And I can tell you as a grandparent, trying to be involved, and in Boy Scouts and various other things, that a lot of the exports do not let you help. They don't want your help, but they also have these damn privacy laws. So you're afraid to say anything? Larry, well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate afraid it. Afraid to say anything, do anything, because somebody might sue you. Thank you. And if it doesn't work, you change the name of the program or the name of the organization. There's uh, going back to 2014, okay. studies Thanks. for collecting all the data down there in the ju juvenile data center. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Your name, sir? Bob Perrin, 101 South 36. Actually, I'm amazed that we've started this process without really having a real program for what we need for space services and the relationships between them. So I, I'm an architect, and I feel sad for the architects trying to design a building that they don't even know how much space they need and what purposes and how they're going to do from one to the other. And I remember, Jerry, in a meeting not too long ago, you said you thought there might be a skywalk, but you didn't know. You hadn't found out yet. They haven't even have it developed. So we're trying to to take property and build things that we don't know exactly what we're going to use them for or how much space we need to accomplish our objectives. That's sad to me, and I think we need to step back and look at our things and make a program for the architect before we proceed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Matt? Oh, yes, sir. Your name, please. Tyler Wilson. 
Uh, my name is Tyler Wilson. I'm a state certified correctional officer. Um, the point of removing kids from shackles, okay, they are transported from the Douglas County Youth Center, which is a detention center, to court because they committed a crime and they're a legal offender by definition. How do you know they committed a crime? Then why are they being detained? Have they been tried? They're pretrial. Okay, they're, 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 they're innocent right. until proven guilty in the court of law. Why are they Thank being you. Okay, all right. Uh, the I hate to be the, the lawyer in this, in but themselves. the children <clears throat> in the juvenile justice system not necessarily charged with a crime under the statutes of Nebraska. There's a lot of reasons a kid ends up in juvenile court that are not crimes. But let's not get bogged down in that. Go ahead. Right. So I, I encourage every one of you, um, if you haven't dealt with these kids directly, go down to the youth center. Go sit in a room with them, unshackled. And if you walk out of there, not with the hair on your back of your neck raised a little bit, by all means remove their shackles. Okay? Do these kids that need drug into court with shackles on? No. If the judge orders it, then they get removed. But when you're going to jeopardize officer safety, to bring them downtown with no restraints, that's an issue. The other thing is I've heard here that we really don't know exactly square footage needs of the courts. Why do we have a building design and we don't really know how much room it needs? I grew up on a farm out in central Nebraska and <laughs> I've seen big red barns with better plans than this juvenile justice center. <coughs> proposed for downtown. So I, I've said it before for the last almost two months, and I'm going to say it again. Let's slow down. Let's rethink this whole process and make sure that what we're building is truly going to work for the next hundred years. I'm all for it. If, if, we, if we do all the proper research and we do all the right things and we come to find that, you know, the space is needed, which it is, but let's build it so it'll last a hundred years. So then 30 years from now, we're not sitting at the same table discussing the same issue about another $120 million bill that me and everyone in this room is going to pay for. I mean, when you go to the grocery <coughs> store, you pay for the groceries that you pick out. Someone else doesn't just do your grocery shopping and then charge your bank account. So why should everyone that pays for this building not have some input? Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Otherwise, we can move on. <coughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Carol Zaychuk, and I am an Omaha citizen and a taxpayer. And again, after even picking up the uh, the assessment, which is available on the 12th floor, <coughs> same thing. Uh, basically, there are a lot of cons to, there are more cons than pros in making these changes. I mean, in, in completely building a new building. Um, but my biggest my biggest concern is, again, being a taxpayer, that I'll be paying for this. I'm, I'll be paying for something I do not agree with. And especially eminent domain, taking away a, a historical landmark building. There are numerous buildings, other alternatives that have been um, even recommended. And that particular building, it's not going to make things so much greater and better to demolish that, as opposed to finding a different building space. That's fine. You know, so I mean, again, if you absolutely have to have everything downtown, again, which makes parking and a lot of other things difficult for the parents of these juveniles, and it's already there and it's already in place, um, it would be against my wishes. However, I mean, again, there are so many other things. I'd like to see this on the ballot. That's what I want. I want Omaha citizens to actually have the opportunity to have the input as to say yay or nay on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, that's almost all the time we had allotted for it. I'm going to say one more time, anyone else? And very good. Thank you. We are going to move on then to number three on our agenda, the public property update. This is the latest in a series of updates from um, our director of public property, Jerry Leahy, on the successful progress of our $45 million uh, public safety bond issue construction project to be constructive, approved by the voters in November of 2016, uh, and uh, on time and on budget. Uh, and Jerry, would you take it from there? Jim, we're losing, so I have to hurry up. <laughs> uh, we're losing them fast. Uh, it, there's two seats attached to the handout, the square foot handout. 
Uh, yes. One is on the correctional center bond issue. These are the timelines. These are the schedules and timelines. Corrections project is broken into two phases. Phase one is completed. Barely starting phase two, you can see a little 2% complete. Uh, we're phasing that in with the availability of the closing of the mods and the rearranging of staff. And thank goodness that Amber has been uh, involved with both phase one construction and now in her acting role, she will be involved even more in phase two. But uh, the, the startup uh, for phase two is going to involve the outdoor and the, the roof roof repair, the, roof, the re roof of the uh, original facility. We can do that without a security issue. When you go in, inside a facility like this, it's a little more difficult to secure it. and escort construction workers in a facility. So we're on schedule, uh, takes time, we're under budget. We're not finished yet, but we're under budget. Okay, is and this, are you finished with this? I, I'm going to move on real quick. But I just wanted to yeah. ask for input. Rhonda, as the acting director of Douglas County Correction Center, uh, and the person most immediately impacted by this uh, project, and I know how difficult it is for you to keep operations going in the middle of the construction phase, could you give us your observation on how it's going? Yeah, things are going fine for the time being. Um, we have not yet entered that phase where we need to talk about shutting down a couple of the housing units in order to accommodate phase two of the construction. Our staff continue to meet regularly on that topic and um, develop plans on how we're going to handle in housing and staffing when we enter that phase. And I don't know, but this could be your first speaking part at the Administrative Services Committee meeting, so if you could give us your name for the record, that would be great. Amber, Amber Redman, Inter Interim Director of Correction. And uh, Amber, congratulations <laughs> on uh, the new position. I know you're going to do a great job and we're excited about working with you. Um, the completion of this that goes out, as you can see on the timeline, uh, well into uh, 2020, is already pretty much there um, on, on phase one, as Mr. Leahy uh, uh, indicated. Do you have a, a complete portion of the correction center that we can go down and look at and it's pretty much all done? And Oh yeah, phase one is completed, and you guys are more than welcome to come down and do a tour of that area at any time. Okay. And I want to apologize, I got your name wrong. That happens okay. to me all the time with my own kids, so <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, Amber. Um, all right, is there anything else on that from either public property or production? Okay. No. So the <clears throat> West Maple Campus update is... Uh, Moving right along. Percentages are creeping up of completion. We're at 58% complete. Uh, and we, we base these percentages based on the payoffs that we've done mm -hmm. to the contractor. So we may have activity that looks like it's more complete than what is on here, but until we make the payment, we don't count it. Uh, and we're on schedule. Mr. Slater is here today from 911. He's uh, anxious to get back in to see a space. I'm going to give him a little tour in the next week or so. <coughs> That's great, and I'd like to go along with you, and, and Claire, I don't know if you have, but these are really interesting uh, uh, tours that get us right into the crux of uh, the operation. And the last time that I was there, it's been a couple of weeks now, um, the 911 center was, the skeleton was there, and they were just starting, I think, to, to hang right. the drywall. Yeah. Uh, but it should be blocked out now. So when you get a, a date, the two of you, please let me know, and Claire, if you'd like to join us. It's, sure. it's really interesting. Let me know this, and if we don't... I promise Patrick and Diane first. But no, that's okay. <laughs> if we don't have this today, uh, we'll want it at the next meeting, because this is very instructive to us in light of what we just talked about. <clears throat> There's a square footage for this building, built in, I believe, 1929? 29 or 27. Okay. Close. 
There's a square footage, and we're redoing the entire building top to bottom. I've literally been from the sub-basement to on the roof, and it's being done completely. There is a dollar amount that we're spending on this building from the public safety bond approved by the voters in 2016, which would give us a square footage cost for the entire redoing of this facility, which is... Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like 50,000 square feet. It's a large, large. 58,000. Okay, 58,000 square feet. When 58, we 881. Okay. Yeah. When we next meet, I know that you have uh, you know, completion numbers on here. Let's start plugging in the numbers to that because when we say that we're on time and on budget, those are real numbers. Those are real dates. Those dates have real numbers on them. So when we come back and we're doing these, you know, bi-monthly now. Uh, semi monthly uh, that we have that that number what we've expended what's left to expend and how that's working out per square foot I think that's going to be real instructive to us uh, going forward I don't know if there's public uh, just a, uh, Jerry could you say what's out what's going into the 156th of May oh sure uh, the 911 center uh, moving over from 156 in West Maple Sheriff's Office Across the road, so to speak, uh, environmental services department, uh, emergency management from down from sea level here is going out to that campus, and the Douglas County Treasurer's office will be a branch office, which will be a facility that we own, and we can eliminate a lease. And that's those are some of the things that we think about when we do planning as to get it into our ownership. So we don't have to lease. That's why I, I wish Mary was still here, but I think when Mary Vysek and I first met, when she took the juvenile job, I think she was at 4,800 square feet. And we are required by statute to supply them with office space. And it's really difficult for me to go to these folks and say, you're not going to believe this, but the legislature just passed another bill that caused Mary to have to hire eight or ten more officers. Or 50. Or 50. One year was, so that's how we got to this square footage of 15,300, whatever it is. But, so these are things that are always in play, and you don't always hear all these things, but we certainly do, and he certainly does, and Commissioner Kavanaugh does also. But um, And these same issues, and then I'll quit. The same issues that the you hear, almost done. <laughs> and I've heard yesterday. Uh, I've had enough meetings with Don Klein and Tom Riley for the last 12 to 15 years, and so has Paul Call. And it's a, as I stated earlier and was mentioned, the Band-Aid approach, the box is completed now in that courthouse. That's the reason for this. And I, I think that's a good point. You know, we can learn from experience. We're undergoing an experience on a $45 million build-out right now. That You know, there's important lessons in there for where we go next. And we are taking, as we uh, said before on this project, a step into the 21st century in terms of Douglas County administration. I mean, not only are we recognizing the population, is way west now. The center of population is closer to 156 of Maple by far than it is to 19th and Harney. But we're taking government to the people because we work for you. So the ideas that we're doing on that are, were predicated on a bunch of the things that we're doing here, which are public hearings, discussions, input from uh, stakeholders and citizens. And we're coming with a great project on time, on budget, no tax increase. So, thank you. We'll need numbers next time. Okay. okay. I don't know if there's anybody else. I have yes, sir. Question. Um, this new, I don't know if you want to call it expansion or move, um, by what percentage will it increase the amount of call load that it can handle? Or I'm sorry, it? the amount of work? Oh, for 911? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, that's a... That's a David. But that's not, but before we get into a long answer, yeah, that's not, has nothing to do with that. That's no. a totally different issue. The call load issue doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we're moving in a new facility. Now, uh, and I'd like to thank our 
911 director for being here today. Thank you, David. Um, the transfer from where you are, which is basically the back half of the sheriff's office, to this brand new state of the art 911 center that we're in the process of building um, involves people and equipment, but the new facility itself uh, has more space for you. Um, does it have new equipment for you as well? Absolutely. It'll be uh, <clears throat> much expanded space and and everything will be new. All the equipment will be new and updated. And it's also planned with a more expansion into the future if necessary. So ideally, with the state-of-the-art technology that will go into the space that we're uh, uh, building out right now, we'll be able to do a better job uh, at what 911 already does a good job at uh, going forward. I, th I think we have great technology now. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the expansion capabilities, we'll be able to meet the needs as the area grows. Okay. But it's, it's also important to note that, you know, concerns that have been expressed in the past about call volume, about the ability to call in during an emergency when call volume is overloaded as it is, um, this isn't going to solve the issues that have been brought up in the past. This is going to help your staff, it's going to help because you have new, the new equipment, but it's not going to be some panacea to resolve issues like if, for example, if we have a natural disaster or, God forbid, a terrorist attack, right now, everybody calls in at one time, you're going to be overwhelmed. So no, there's no new technology that we can provide that's going to resolve issues like that. No, not on a, uh, a huge volume basis, like in a crisis we had, or as an example, it happened here with New Year's, right. or excuse me, with the fireworks. Fourth of July, Fifth of July, right. 5th of July. July. it was just a sheer volume. We could have had 50 or 60 people answering 911 <coughs> lines at one time and probably not kept up. So it was an example of uh, just sheer volume. Uh, could that happen any day in the event of a major disaster in the area? Yes, it could. But if you talk to anybody that has 911 center expertise and experience, you can't build a center for that, possibly. Even your larger centers from larger, even larger cities the, that capability of having that capability available every day would be uh, financially, uh, would, you just wouldn't be able to do that for technology wise. But uh, we are taking some steps, some plans for next year, 5th of July, type of uh, ways that we could uh, help that out. And uh, you'll probably see some of that coming out this summer. That's great. And you know, uh, technology is evolving at such a pace that you know just keeping up with it is uh, a real challenge. But I know that you're doing a great job, and uh, hopefully, with the completion of this state-of-the-art 911 center, we'll be able to do even better in the future. Thanks again. We are at 3:27, and I was shooting for 3:30, but we don't have to wait for three more minutes unless anyone else has. Well, we're done. We are adjourned. Thank you.